Genesis 9, and we're going to look at verses 18 through 29. Finish off this ninth chapter here in the book of Genesis. Now tonight, we're going to look at one of the saddest stories in the Bible. And that is the failure of Noah after he has spent a lifetime of obedience and service to God. The reason why I say it's a sad story is because, you know, it's, it's sad whenever I hear this kind of a story or see it take place. And it's really a warning to me personally. And I hope it's a warning to you as well. I think that this is why this story is in the scripture as a warning to anyone that thinks, I could never do that. Well, the Bible does not hide the sins and the failures of its most celebrated heroes. And this is an incredible f failure. Noah's drunkenness here. Now, how does this happen? How does this take place in somebody's life like Noah, who has been obedient to God all his life? I mean, Noah has had God speak to him specifically, directly. God has provided for him, sustained him through all of the incredible violence and, and the struggle of just building the ark. He saw God's judgment. He saw God fulfill his word and do exactly what he said he was going to do. And he brought judgment on the entire world. And he saw himself and his wife and his sons and their wives, well, delivered, incredibly delivered through this judgment. And then he does this. How does that happen? Well, let's just read the story here first. Verse 18. Now the sons of Noah who went out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham was the father of Canaan. These three were the sons of Noah, and from these the whole earth was populated. And Noah began to be a farmer, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk, and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, the, a servant of servants, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood 350 years. And so all of the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. So, how does Noah take this action? How does he get to this place? How could Noah have fallen? Well, I just have to say to you, it's the same way anybody falls. And I don't think that anybody is safe from a fall if they do not follow and pursue the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind. Because that really is your only protection. You need to love the Lord with all of your heart, mind, and soul. You need to love the Lord with everything you have, and that is your greatest protection. Why do I say that? Because the Bible describes the fall, anyone's fall, in, a, in, well, many different ways. The one I think is probably the most picturesque is wandering. 
It says in James 5, 19 and 20. It says, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone turns him back, let him know that he has turned a sinner from the error of his way and will save a soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. So the Bible describes the potential, the possibility for someone who is a believer and is exampled here by Noah's fall to wander from the truth. And that's how it takes place. It's literally in every case I have ever counseled in, with anybody. I ask them, how did you get here? How did you get to this place? And they will tell me this series of choices that they made, in, first in their thoughts and then in their actions. And so it's a, it's a wandering. It's a series of bad choices that causes a person to wander from their place of strength. And the only place of strength you have is to be in love with the Lord. That is your protection. That is your security. That is your strength. Because He is my strength. And I, if I am following Him and He's Lord of my life, I'm in love with Him, then I shall not want. That is the reality. Now, Noah let down his guard. And with every fall, the Bible declares that there are some central reasons. And those central reasons, one is pride. It says in Proverbs 16, 18, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And every time a person falls, it's because of a haughty spirit. It's because of arrogance. This is why Paul warns us in 1 Corinthians 10, 12. Let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. So if you read this text this, tonight and you said to yourself, well, I'd never do that. Watch out. You, you, you've got an, you got an attitude of pride. You think you're strong. You think you can't ever do that. Well, I beg to differ with you. You can and if you wander from the truth, if you wander from that, the place of strength, then anybody can fall. And I tell you, I've, I've seen people that I thought, how could this happen to them? But when you talk to them and you ask them specifically what took place, they will tell you they made this series of choices and they wandered from the truth. They wandered from their first love. This is again why the scripture tells us in 1 John 2, 15 and 16. It says there do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It is not of the Father, but is of the world. So, I mean, John here again, he's writing to believers. And he's telling believers, don't start loving something else more than you love the Lord. Or else the love of, I mean, the love of the world and the love of the Father are completely antithetical to one another. They are complete opposites. I can't play with the world and think I'm going to stay in love with God. It's just not going to happen. And yet, we think we can get away with it. We think, I can do this. I am strong. This isn't going to catch me. It isn't going to take a hold of me. And it does every single time. The third thing that people don't realize about falls is it's, they're usually, it's always based on lies. I mean, if you look at the first fall in Genesis 3, I mean, how did, how did Eve fall? A lie. Just lies. And when people believe those lies, they will stumble. And there are plenty of lies. The first lie is, you're strong. You're a tough guy. You're really spiritual. And this won't happen to you. Well, it's a lie. 
You're not a, a tough guy. You're not strong. My strength is because I know him and I'm in love with him and he is controlling my life. He's on the throne of my heart. That's why I will be strong. And that's the only reason I will be strong and not go in the path of this world. In Amos 2.4, it says this, Thus says the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah, yet and for four, I will not turn away its punishment, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept His commandments. Their lies lead them astray. Lies which their fathers followed. So lies lead a person astray. It, that's what leads a person to wander. And so, you know, tonight, if you're not passionately in love with the Lord, you are in a dangerous place. And so I, I warn you tonight, I, I pray the Holy Spirit is bringing this warning to your heart because the only place of strength is a place that it's the first and great commandment. Love Him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Now, this story is here in the, in the Scripture, I believe, for a reason. It's here as a warning and as a revelation. It's a revelation to Noah and his sons that this can take place. Notice, the sinful world has been destroyed, but sin is still in the heart of man. And unless that individual addresses that sin and keeps himself in the love of God, then you're going to have trouble. And so that is why the scripture encourages us to take this action. And this is why this particular story is here. So are you wandering tonight? That's the question. Have you been wandering tonight? And if you have, I encourage you Ask the Lord to show you what lies you're listening to and what is the truth and what are you loving more than Him? That's what you have to turn away from. That's what you have to get rid of or you will stumble. Now, let's talk about wine and drinking because that's the subject here of this particular story. You have a story here of a man who became a farmer. Nothing wrong with that. He plants a vineyard and he drinks the wine from this vineyard and he becomes drunk. Now, the multitudes of problems that I have counseled over the years, do you know that the majority of the problems that I have counseled all rotate around alcohol or drugs of some kind? Most of the time it's alcohol. And that's just reality. That's all I can say. If I, if, you, if I lined up every single person I've ever talked to that struggled or had a family problem or had a personal problem or a marital problem, it rotates around drugs or alcohol. That's one of the primary issues. And it's just a fact. Now, the first mention in the Bible of drinking wine is this. And the first mention of anything in the scripture is really an important revelation. And so we have here a description of this man drinking and getting drunk and making a fool of himself and causing all kinds of problems on down the line with his family. Now, the word drunken in this particular passage is a Hebrew word that literally means to be tipsy. That's where you get the work, the concept of being tipsy. A person is drunk. They are unstable. They, they can't stand up straight or they're a little off balance. Now, that is the definition of drunkenness. I, people ask me this all the time. They go, well... Steve, it's, it's not a sin if I drink a glass of wine, is it? And I tell them, no, it's not a sin to drink a glass of wine. But it is a sin to get drunk. 
And so they say, well then, well, where, where is it? Where, where, where's the line? Uh, you know, how many drinks is it before I'm drunk? Now, when anybody's asking that, they're saying, how close can I get to the line before I cross it? That's danger. That's danger. All I can say to a person is, if you feel it, you're drunk. You're tipsy. If you feel it, you have crossed the line. So I say to a person, you know what? Yeah, you can drink if you want, but why would you want to? Why would you want to do that? Why would you want to get to that place to where you have the potential of crossing that line, sinning, and then you have the potential of doing something incredibly stupid and idiotic, and you're going to make a fool of yourself, or you're going to say something or do something that is foolish and you're going to regret it or you're going to get into an argument with your wife or your husband or your kids or with somebody something's going to happen and people think you know what i I, that isn't going to happen to me steve that's the first problem we talked about tonight i think i'm stronger than that well i can say to you personally i'm not and i'm not going there And I haven't had a drink in the last, gosh, 43 years. And it's not going to happen because I've seen the result. I've seen the result in people's lives. Now, you say, well, Jesus teaches something different in the New Testament, doesn't he, Steve? No, he doesn't. In Luke 21, 34 through 36, notice what Jesus said. He said, but take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing, drunkenness, and the cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch therefore, pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things, and that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. Now notice that first verse there, verse 34. Take heed to yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness. Now carousing is probably the worst translation of this particular Greek word. You know what this word literally means? It means to be giddy with wine or tipsy with wine. It's talking about, well, you're under the influence. And then the second word, drunkenness, is complete intoxication. So notice that Jesus puts those two things together so that it's very clear to people. And it would be if you were reading it in Greek. It is not from this particular translation. And so Jesus makes it very clear. This is something that you need to be concerned about as well as the cares of this life lest the second coming come upon you unaware. Very important. So Noah here is caught by, well, a very unwise activity. And that's really the way I describe drinking to any Christian. The Bible just declares it to be unwise. This is what it says in Proverbs 20, verse 1. Wine is a mocker. Strong drink is a brawler, and whoever is led astray by it is not wise. So notice, wine will ultimately mock you one day. It is a mocker. It, that's it. it has that ability to mock you and your testimony. Strong drink is something that will cause you to be a brawler, to get into trouble, conflict. And whoever is led astray, notice, it's kind of a slow leading astray. Same issue as we looked at earlier in this study. But he says it's not wise. Another proverb, Proverb 23, verses 29 and 30. He says, who has woe? Who has sorrow? Who has contentions? Who has complaints? Who has wounds without cause? Who has redness of eyes? those who linger long at the wine. 
those who go in search of mixed wine. So he's basically saying, this is not, if you, if you don't want woe, sorrow, contentions, complaints, wounds, and redness of eyes, or a good solid hangover, then don't do it. Now, people always say, well, wait a minute, you know, there are, are I mean, Jesus drank wine, Jesus, hey, he made water into wine, didn't he? That's the one that everybody always brings up. And you know what I usually ask him? I ask him, well, did Jesus make fermented wine? Is that what you're saying? So think that one through. They're at a wedding. Every, all the wine is gone. And Jesus is going to make more wine to get people more drunk? Is that, is that what you're saying Jesus did? I don't think so. I don't believe he made fermented wine. In fact, the actual word wine is used many times in the scripture for unfermented grape juice. Do you realize that? In fact, Jesus spoke of unfermented grape juice. He called it new wine. If you go to the book of Judges, there is a great story of a man who went out and harvested grapes, crushed them, and it says offered the wine to the people in his house. That grape juice could not have fermented. And so the Bible uses this term. In those particular days without refrigeration, if they kept grape juice for any time, they would always mix it with water. And you again, you will find this particular terminology used over and over again in the Old and New Testament, mixing it with water. And so when they mixed it with water, obviously that was to keep anybody from getting intoxicated. And so when people say, well, there's, there's verses that look like it's okay. Well, I guarantee you there are 10 verses to any one that may even appear, and which I think it's an incorrect view that the Bible condones drinking. So when people drank wine in the New Testament, it most likely was unfermented grape juice. That's what it was. Now, if you are interested in looking at a study on this, I have a, an article, one of my elders gave me this uh, a while back, and it's called Wine in the Bible. And we put it on our special speakers icon, uh, and it, the entire article is there online so you can read it. And I would encourage you to do so. It's 25 pages, but I guarantee you, if you want to understand this particular topic in the scripture and understand the Greek words and how this word, these words are used in classical Greek and in the Bible, I'd encourage you to read it because it's a, an incredibly well done article and it is essential to give you that balance and that understanding on this subject. So calvaryag.org, special speakers, and it's the first one on the list, right up at the top, you can't miss it. It would be very enlightening for you. Okay, so next, what did Ham do that was so evil here? Notice in the text here, it says, verse 22, Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. So why is that such a bad thing? Is that such an evil thing that it would bring this kind of consequence? Well, something I think much more evil was done here than is recorded for us in the text, and I'll get to that in a minute. But just the fact of looking on his father's nakedness is something, again, that is incredibly evil. And it is spoken about in the scripture quite often. He saw the nakedness of his father and he mocked his, his father to his two brothers. That's clear from the text. 
And so this, when it's, it says here that he told his brothers, the Hebrew here is to speak with in a, and to tell this in a mocking way. So he was basically mocking his father after seeing his father's nakedness. Now, in Leviticus chapter 18, verses 6 through 8, notice what it says there. None of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. The nakedness of your father or the nakedness of your mother you shall not uncover. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of your father's wife you shall not uncover. It is your father's nakedness. And now if you go through this 18th chapter of Leviticus, he then goes into uncovering the nakedness of your sister, your brother, your cousin, and he just goes through this list. And I mean, it, it's a little monotonous. I mean, 24 times he says, don't look on the nakedness of someone that is not your spouse. That's his, his exhortation. Why? Because ultimately you will, as he says here, none of you shall approach anyone near of kin to him. That's approaching them in a sexual way. So he is saying, by seeing this nakedness, this is the temptation you have, is a sexual temptation. Now, I warn parents about this uh, often. Uh, parents sometimes come in, they'll ask me about this particular subject. And I'll tell them, you know what? You need to encourage your children around your household and anybody that you're around to be modest and to be covered up when they come out of their bedroom or out of the shower. I don't care uh, who it is or what family it is. This is just wisdom. Now, I can't go into some of the counseling sessions that I have had where that has not taken place and there has been sexual molestation that has taken place in a family, but it happens all of the time. And the reason why it takes place is simply because of the lust of man. I mean, God knows what a, the sinful heart of man is like, and that's why he says, you know what? Cover up the nakedness of anyone other than your spouse. Then you're not going to have any trouble. You're not going to have any problems in this direction. Now, I tell you, I have had parents that have said, oh, that's no big deal. You know, we take showers together. You know, our kids walk around the house. They go jump in the pool naked. That's not a wise idea. Not a wise idea. And it will only bring trouble. Now, if you add alcohol into that situation, you really got trouble. And again, that is the case many times. When somebody gets a little tipsy, then all of a sudden they take an action that they are going to regret for the rest of their life because it destroys a family and somebody's going to go to jail. And that's not a pretty thing. In Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 15, Woe to him who gives drink to his neighbor, pressing him to your bottle, even to make him drunk, that you may look on his nakedness. So notice those two issues put together because many times they go directly together. And so it's just a very unwise thing. Now last year, why did Noah curse Canaan, Ham's son? Why didn't he curse Ham? himself. Now that is the question that people ask about this particular passage and they say, you know, this doesn't sound fair. I mean, Ham is the one who mocks his father, Noah, but Canaan, his son, is the one who gets cursed by Noah. So was he just hung over, you know, was he just, was there some, you know, was he just an angry man? 
at this particular point? No, I don't think so, not at all. Notice that Canaan is the younger of four sons of Ham. We know that if you go into Genesis 10 and verse 6. It says, The sons of Ham were Cush, Mizarim, Put, and Canaan. And they always give the children's names in order like that, in order of their birth order. And you'll see this again throughout the scripture. So we know Canaan was the fourth son of Ham. And so this had to have been, gosh, probably 20, 30, 40 years after the flood, because obviously you gotta have time for the vineyard to grow and to uh, bear the fruit of grapes. Uh, and all these children have to be born and they have to come of age. So, so this is quite a while after the, the flood. Now people say Canaan didn't do anything, so why is he cursed here? Well, I would not assume that Canaan did not do something because I think the text says that he did do something. By this reason, for this reason, notice verse 24. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. So this is talking about something more than just seeing the nakedness of his father. He did something. He said, I know what you have done to me. Now, why doesn't the scripture specifically address what it is because it is probably uh, the details of this would be too coarse to record in the scripture but this was probably some kind of a heinous sexual act that took place and it is not recorded for us but something was done now notice it says he know he knew what his younger son had done now the reason why I think that Canaan did do something is because Canaan is the younger son of Ham. Ham is not the younger son of Noah. How do we know that? Well, every place that the three sons of Noah are recorded for us in Scripture, well, turn back with me to chapter 9, verse 18. We read this as we started tonight. Now the sons of Noah went out from out of the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So Ham was the middle son of Noah, not the younger son of Noah. But Canaan was the younger son or grandson of Noah. And that's why I think that Canaan did do something. Now, the usage of the word son, is that, would that be appropriate? He knew what his younger son would do. Yes, it is. Because this particular term can refer to your actual son. It can refer to your grandson. It can refer to your great-grandson. Or great-great-great-great-great-grandson, depending on the text. Let me show you a verse of scripture where that is true. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 1, it says the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. There are 14 generations between Jesus and David, and there are 14 generations between David and Abraham. So here is the way you see that particular term used. So I would surmise that Canaan did do something because, again, the scripture declares that a son is not going to be guilty or cursed because of what someone else does, okay? So this is an important truth. In Ezekiel 18.20, there God says, the soul who sins shall die. The son shall not bear the guilt of the father, nor the father bear the guilt of the son. 
And the righteousness of the righteous shall be upon himself. And the wickedness of the wicked shall be upon himself. So that tells me that in God's justice, he will never punish somebody's grandson if he didn't do anything. Okay? So there is something that has taken place here that is so heinous it is not described. He just says, I know what my grandson has done the youngest son here and this is the result he will be cursed because of it in deuteronomy 24 16 it says as well fathers shall not be put to death for their children nor shall children be put to death for their fathers a person shall be put to death for his own sin so Everybody bears their, their responsibility for their own sin and their own guilt. I'm not going to have to pay for what my father did, and my son is not going to have to pay for what I have done. Everybody is responsible before God for themselves. So, did this curse that came forth from Noah, did it come to pass? Was this, did this actually occur? Yeah, it did. It actually was fulfilled. This is a prophetic utterance by Noah of what will come to pass through Canaan and the sons of Canaan. The Canaanites are the ones described as the descendants of Canaan. And I, I think that most of you with any biblical knowledge know the Canaanites were not nice people. They were vile, immoral, they were idolaters, they offered their children in sacrifice to the god of Baal and Molech. They were not good people. And they ultimately became the servants of the descendants of Shem, who are the Jewish people. Because when Joshua came into the land of Canaan, what happened? He made a covenant with the Gibeonites, which were the t descendants of Canaan. And the Canaanites lived in the entire area there of the nation Israel. And so they ultimately became hewers of wood and servants of Shem. Notice in uh, Genesis 10, we're going to look at this uh, next week, in verses 15 through 19. Notice here it, it reveals who the descendants of Canaan were. Verse 15, Canaan begot Sidon, his firstborn, and Heath, and the Jebusite, the Amorite, and the Girgesite, the Hivite, the Archite, and the Sinite, and the Arvidite, the Zemorite, and the Hamathite. Afterward, the families of the Canaanites were dispersed. And the border of the Canaanites was from Sidon, which is north up in what is modern-day Lebanon today. As you go toward Gerar, as far as G uh, Gaza, and Gaza is in the Gaza Strip, which is on the southern uh, western part of uh, the Mediterranean uh, and the area of Israel, there on the, on the shores. And there, and then he says here, lost my place here, as far as Gaza, then as you go toward Sodom and Gomorrah, Adama, Zobium, as far as Lacia. And so uh, Lacia is in modern day Jordan today. So basically you've got from Lebanon all the way down through the land of Israel, all the way east over into the Jordan uh, the area of, of what is today modern-day Jordan. So these were the descendants of Canaan, and these people ultimately became subjugated, and ultimately they disappeared. They became extinct, literally, because of their uh, immorality and their child sacrifice. Now... People have used this curse of Noah to 
say that this curse really is a curse upon uh, the black African of uh, Africa. And this is a statement that has no biblical basis at all. The descendants of Ham that became the peoples of Africa came not from Canaan, but came from this another two other sons of Noah, Cush and Put. And they are the African peoples. They were the descendants that brought forth all African peoples. So this particular curse has nothing to do with slavery of black Africans. It has nothing to do with American slavery. And uh, people use this as justification for slavery. And it is biblically a completely unsound uh, argument. Uh, the sons of Ham, Cush, and Put were the sons that brought forth all African peoples. And basically all you have to do is just look up these particular uh, names and you can find the geographical areas which we're going to look at in our study next week. Because chapter 10 is probably one of the most incredible uh, historical documents in all of literature on our planet. And we'll look at that next week. Now, notice he goes on here, he says, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants. And that's what he became. He shall be to his brethren. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. So, blessed be the Lord. Now, this is the personal name of God, Jehovah. Blessed be Jehovah, the God of Shem. So, Shem is the man in the line of, to Christ. He is in the line to the Messiah. And he was the man who loved the Lord of Noah's sons. And that's why he is described here as being blessed and his God is the Lord Jehovah God. Verse 27, may God enlarge Japheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem and may Canaan be his servant. Now, God enlarged Japheth and all of his peoples, the the descendants of Japheth are many more than the descendants of Shem. We'll see this in our study next week. Uh, the descendants of Japheth are all of the Europeans, uh, all of the uh, Scandinavian peoples, all the way across Russia and over into China. And so obviously a great larger number of people. And ultimately, I mean, if you, if your descendants came from Europe, you're a descendant of Japheth. That's how you, that's who you're a descendant of. And so, uh, very important. Now notice this statement, this last statement here, may God enlarge Japheth and may he dwell in the tents of Shem. So he's going to enjoy the blessings uh, within the tent of Shem. And so he's going to enjoy the blessings. The, the descendants of Japheth are going to enjoy the blessings of the God of Shem or Jehovah. And so very interesting terminology. Uh, let me show you the opposite terminology. In Psalm 84.10, it says there, For a day in your courts is better than a thousand. I would rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. So to dwell in the tents of wickedness, obviously in this context, refers to uh, ex partaking in wickedness. I don't want to dwell in the tents of wickedness. I don't want to partake in wickedness. And so to dwell in the tents of Shem is to dwell in the blessing of, of the God of Shem and the blessings that that God will bring upon these peoples. And so 
that's the meaning of this terminology that, that he will dwell in the tents of Shem. It doesn't mean he's going to conquer Shem or overcome them. He's going to enjoy the blessings of his tent. In those days, if you came into somebody's tent, they would offer food, uh, water, whatever you had need of. And you would enjoy the blessings of their tent. And so this is the terminology that's used. So I hope that has explained this very difficult passage of Scripture. Amen. Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that, Lord, your, your word is so powerful. Father, it warns us not to, to become haughty not to wander from the truth. And so, Lord, I pray for any wandering heart here tonight. Lord, any wandering heart that's going to listen to this study, I pray that you would turn that heart to you, passionately toward you. And, Father, we, we believe you to do that. Lord, you, you can turn us back. Lord, we, we can turn away, but you can turn us back. Lord, help us to turn to you with all our heart, with all our soul, and with all our mind. Lord, we, we just surrender to you tonight. Take these truths and, Lord, make us, make us humble. In Jesus' name, amen.